I'm addressing here, I'm just recognizing something of a mixed group, okay? There's those people who are preparing in significant ways for the specific missions that God has laid on their hearts and that they're developing. They're developing the capacities and the talents for those missions and callings. And there's other people for whom maybe the callings aren't so specific. There's still a calling. There's still a calling, but maybe not so specific. And because of that, the preparation hasn't been quite so specific. Okay? When we start, start, start to talk about preparation, we're talking about education, right? So that's a lot of what I'm bringing here is something of a presence as an educator. I'm bringing some of my experience, some of my background, and also some of my own journey, okay, as, as I've gone and developed as an educator. What I'm going to be basically suggesting this morning is that in education, just like anywhere else, education isn't absent from this, in education there's always going to be in view, there's always going to be in the imagination some kind of picture of what a good life looks like and that educators aren't immune from this. And when we talk about what it means to have in view that picture of what that good life is like, we're going to talk about it in terms that the Bible uses, that is a city. Okay, so as we go develop that, we're going to be talking about cities and then, well, what kind of city is your education preparing you to long for, to set your affection on, that is to love. Okay, so that's a challenge, I think, especially I'd aimed for that challenge to be present here for the people being prepared, being educated, but I think it applies for anybody here as well. First, just a little bit of background. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 6.21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Think about that a little bit. Treasure. Treasure. Hordes of gold, that's a treasure, mountains of silver, diamonds. People fight over treasures. Right? They, they fight over what they imagine is worthwhile. People go on expeditions to find and uncover treasure. And, and likewise, some of our best childhood memories, at least as I remember them, are enchanted by treasure. We thought we'd find treasure in this little stream that ran through our backyard. That's where you find treasures, right? By water. Um, that's, that's what we thought. But, but, but you notice the relationship that Jesus is making here. There's treasures, things that are seen as valuable, things we long for, things we're willing to put out big expenses of, of time and of energy for. There's treasure and then there's hearts. And the connection here is the heart follows its treasure. The heart seeks its treasure. Our hearts move us toward our treasure. It might be safe to say our hearts are built on their treasure. They want it. They seek it. That's what treasure is about, remember? Treasures are seen as worthwhile, so our hearts want our treasure, and nothing is going to keep a heart from its treasure. It just will seek it. So the question becomes not, is there a treasure? It's, what's the treasure? A heart seeks its treasure. What's in the treasure chest? What's being seen as worthwhile? What's being treasured? What's being seen as worth committing to? What's being seen as worth sacrificing for? There's always a treasure. Because the reality is, the reality is we all have a treasure. People who are preparing for ministry are no, not except from this. Neither are educators in their ivory towers. There's a treasure. There's always a treasure. And another way to say this is that um, we're always for something. Humans like us, we're always oriented towards something. We're always directed towards something. We're always in motion from one place to another place. We're not just static. We're always in motion. We're always looking for that treasure. And we're always moving toward it. We're always identifying obstacles to it and removing those obstacles. And we're always trying to build bridges 
toward what we see as valuable, toward what we're treasuring. That's just who we are. And, and the ancients, they had a way of talking about this that we kind of lost touch with in the modern era especially. They, they, and I'll just give you the shorthand here. They used the word telos to describe this. We're always oriented as humans towards some telos. We always have an end in mind. We always have a goal. We always have in view a good city. And we're always moving toward that. That's just who we are as humans. Augustine, he uh, suggests this in his confessions. He says, my weight is my love. Wherever I am carried, my love is carrying me. I've always got in mind some view of what we think is going to bring, bring us happiness. And it's not so trivial as to say it just kind of guides us. We love it. We love our treasure. So as important, um, as important as preparation might be, as important as thinking is, and I enjoy, I enjoy the life of thinking, I enjoy the academy, the ivory tower, I do enjoy those things. But I found, I found in my experience that it's really, really important, both in the academy, but maybe especially as a pastor, it's very important for me to always keep this kind of inquiring attitude toward my thinking and toward the thinking of other people that I encounter because I get to encounter a lot of thoughtful people. I've always got to be asking that question. Where is that thinking taking us? Okay. Where, where are the loves being developed here and where are those loves being directed? Where, what direction are they taking us? Okay. What are we moving toward? What are we treasuring? So that's one part here. Hold on to that. Our loves, our treasures, the heart will seek its treasure. It will love it. <clears throat> I want to introduce something else here. Cities. Oh, in cities, and here I'm just going to pick up this theme biblically of doing a little bit of, call it biblical theology. I get very excited about this. Um, when, cities, when cities are first introduced in the Bible, they tend to be portrayed as bad when they're first introduced. They're a human response. In Genesis, they're a human response of self-assertiveness and presumption. Okay? Humans, they come together and they structure their lives in a way that helps them to get ahead. There's Cain and his city in Genesis 4. It has a wall around it because Cain is afraid that anyone who finds him is going to kill him. And inside those walls, there's a culture of revenge and violence. Lamech, generations after Cain, he gives these words, which describe the culture of that city. If you wound me, I'm paraphrasing, if you wound me, I'll kill you. If you sue me for $700, I'll counter sue for $49,000. So you've got to ask yourself, who are the heroes going to be in this city? What's prized? What's treasured? Who is going to get ahead? Does the city of Cain remind you of any other cities, either historically, perhaps of cities that you've encountered? And you're already feeling a city is a way of organizing yourself. It's a way of organizing your life. It's a way of cultivating loves and affections. And we move on in Genesis 10.8, we're introduced to Nimrod. He's a powerful warrior, and he's a hunter who founded Babel. And Babel isn't quite so interested in retaliation, like Cain's city, very interested in defensiveness and retaliation. Wound me, I'll kill you. That's not the city of Babel quite so much. Uh, Babel is interested in honor. You know, it's interested in accomplishment and recognition. So it's not very much of a surprise that right in the middle of the city of Babel, there is a tower which reaches toward the heavens 
so that the name of Babel will be on the lips of everyone. Their name will become great. What's being treasured here? Does it seem familiar to any cities that you've seen? Can you recognize the pattern? What are the loves? What's the treasure in that city? So in the treasures of each of these cities, and we can go ahead, there's more. There's more cities in Scripture. In each of these cities, though, there's, there are commitments. There's practices. There's politics. There's ways of treasuring certain things. And there's ways of organizing and understanding human society, some of them deeply corrupt. But there's always a treasure. There's always a treasure. There's always in view some kind of thing that these people deem as being worthwhile and say, yes, that's what's worth committing to. That's worth loving. Okay. And Babylon especially it becomes a shorthand way for God's people to describe a city that's organized around deliberate and unstoppable violence. And whatever is conquered by that violence is swept along into the empire. And it's tragic. It's tragic because it's so far removed. That city of Babylon is so far removed from the trusting, outward turned, and blessing of the nations that's described to be belonging to the people of God. That's God's city. It becomes the new Jerusalem. And Egypt becomes another kind of city, another way of organizing. Uh, it's picked up to describe a suppressive system. Babylon's a conquering system. Babylon, Egypt is a, something of a suppressive system with one man at the top who holds God's people in bondage. It's picked up. It's all through Scripture. Egypt, Babylon. Assyria, especially in the Old Testament, becomes another kind of city. It becomes this ruthless and merciless, vicious city that doesn't really care about getting work out of people. It doesn't really care about sweeping people into the empire. It's, it's just bloodlust. ISIS, maybe. Okay. Well, it's organized around violence. And by the time we go forward into the revelation, that's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the new Jerusalem and Babylon are set in pitched conflict. Okay. They represent irreconcilably different pictures of what humans treasure and of how humans, how far they're going to go to organize their lives around what they treasure. Babylon, it's about coercion, it's about force, it's about might. The new Jerusalem, it's the city of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And by the, I'm backing up just a little bit from there. You know, you know there's a, in Matthew 5, Jesus takes his followers onto a mountainside. He sits them down and he talks to them. And among other things, he says to them, you are the light of the world. A what? A city. You are a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And then he describes something of the constitution of that city. Okay, that's a city, Jesus. What's it going to look like? Well, it looks like this. It looks like it's not for the powerful. It's for the poor in spirit. It's for the mourning. It's for the hungering and thirsting. It's for the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted. These are the heroes of that city. What's in the treasure chest? What's being loved now? And we realize as we read on through our New Testaments that, that Jesus is not just teaching about the new Jerusalem. He's the king as well. And unlike King Cain from Cain's city who retaliates, he defeats violence through death and through the power of God. Unlike the glory-seeking King Nimrod, he empties himself 
And, and he patiently allows God to glorify him when the time is right, after his death. He is King Jesus. And he's building a city which treasures the trust of God. It blesses the nations. And there's a king here who liberates and frees people from bondage, which binds up the brokenhearted and heals the sick. And yes, the people in this city, they join Christ, not just in his victory, but also in his sufferings too. When Jesus tells us in Matthew 6.33 to seek first the kingdom of God, part of what he's saying is you're going to have to want that. You're going to have to love his kingdom. You're going to have to desire it even more than these other cities. And not surprisingly then, in the, in the Revelation again, when the new Jerusalem descends from heaven to earth, remember that picture? She comes how? Like a bunch of ideas. Like a constitution, no. She comes like a bride adorned for her husband. She's the loved one. She's the desired one the cherished one. Okay. So the question here is not, am I loving a city? That's not the question. Am I loving a city? The question is, which city? Which city? Am I loving? Which city am I investing in? Which city am I longing for? Which city am I committing to and offering my best energies to? There is no city absent space. There's always a city. There's always a city. And the question becomes, where? Which one? Where are my allegiances lying? What am I longing for? And I'll just insert here from that perspective, I've spent some time in education, maybe too much, arguably, um, but that is one of my primary roles is in education. And I'm just going to insert here quickly a little plug <clears throat> before we move on. There is these days a lot of soul searching in Christian higher education. There's a lot of soul searching in education in general, college and university especially. And there, there's, there is a sense, not among everybody, but there is a sense that I've gathered that, um, that Christian educators fear that we've taken too many cues as educators. We've taken too many cues, too much inspiration, and modeled too much after our secular counterparts. And the result is an education which sometimes can have this kind of veneer of Christianity directed at the head, Right? with a whole lot of loves which are being shaped by other cities. A lot of affections that are being shaped by other cities. And then, well, if you just address the head, you're going to be okay. Um, so I, I have a few books here, and I don't know, just to keep you all involved, I wonder if we can't just start passing these around. These have been significant for me. There's a lot of others. Uh, here's two that talk about some of the shaping power of habit and culture. Thank you, Bryant. And then this one, Learning to Love, very recent one um, that as students would come to Faith Builders, some of them are interested in going on for further education after they're with us. And we've been looking for a book for them, for those that are interested in pursuing university or college education especially, one that just can quickly get them engaged with some of what they're going to face. Learning to Love has been really helpful there. So I'm borrowing from some of how he talks about higher education there. So credit there to Sossler for talking about education as always directing us towards some city. Okay. And those can go around. Please don't lose track of them entirely. <clears throat> okay, so two things. Remember, so far, 
You love a treasure. There's always a treasure. And to make that connection, there's always being cultivated some kind of picture of a city that's worth loving. There's a treasure, there's a city. And that's a significant part of what our lives mean. We're moving towards some vision of what that treasure is going to attach itself to. What kind of city is deemed worth loving? And I'm going to suggest to us here, well, it's more than a suggestion, I just think it's true, that uh, education always is cultivating some view of some city. And I'll be offering here three cities which tend to be these days, emphasized three cities in higher education. And um, I'll describe those for a little bit. I'll offer some comments on it. And then we'll spend a little bit of time, as time remains, to talk about uh, an education for the kingdom of God, for the new Jerusalem, that is. So, first, three cities. And you'll find these in different mixtures. I think some colleges or universities tend toward one or the other, but they're always here. They're always here, and they're not all bad. Okay? The first is the city of thinkers. The city of thinkers. It's like Charles Dickens paints for us in his book. I'm missing which one it is, but he gives us a picture of... Um, Professor Thomas Gradgrind. And Gradgrind is a stickler for the facts. Facts, he says, are alone what is wanted in life. And when Gradgrind calls a new student, uh, Sissy Jupe, to tell the class about herself, Sissy manages to reveal, among stuttering, that her father is a horse trainer and that profession is well beneath grad grind. So he demands of Sisti to tell the class what a horse is. And she responds, but not to the satisfaction of grad grind, who likes the facts. So he scolds her for not providing any facts about horses before turning to another student who provides the correct answer. In grad grind's mind, Quadruped, gramnimonious, gramnivorous, 40 teeth, namely 24 grinders, 4 eye teeth, and 12 incisors, and he goes on. He gives us the textbook definition. And the irony here is, of course, that, that Sissy knew more. Sissy knew more about horses than anybody else in the class, let alone grad grind. Now, Gradgrind and his way of looking at the world, his outlook, his city, is a great example of this kind of enlightenment outlook. In this outlook, humans, and this is what's important in the city of thinkers, humans have finally gotten rid of the authority of a king or a church, and we get to rebuild our lives on reason and observation. Just the facts. Okay? And the cry emerges from this city, think for yourself. Look around you at the world and think for yourself. What we need to do is put on our big boy pants and our big girl dresses and grow up. Leave behind your authorities, the guides of your past, Observe, reason, think. Your mind will save you, and science will guide you. If you can't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, or measure it, then it cannot be certain. And if it's anything grad grind can't stand, it's a lack of certainty. So how would you see this working out in education? I would suggest this. In education, this tends to work out as seeing us uh, human beings, as seeing a student as basically an enormous head. 
absent a body, you package content up and ignore the many other ways that we're being formed. Okay. It's mostly just about the passing on of a body of information. And also you're going to see, after a while, this kind of posture of looking out at the world and thinking that whatever can't be known by science is unknowable or maybe not even worth knowing at all, or perhaps it doesn't even exist. Because there's two basic things in the world, there's science and then there's fairy tales. Right? You might be in the city of thinkers if you're hearing things like that. It also tends to ignore other forms of knowing which people like Sissy had. And these forms of knowing, if you ask what a horse is, I'm gonna trust Sissy not grad grind, right? Because grad grind really doesn't know what a horse is, does he? So there's gonna be a big blind spot if you're in the city of thinkers, there's gonna be a big blind spot about the kind of education which happens constantly outside the classroom. There's education, folks, happening in the frat house. There's education happening in the cafeteria. There's education happening when you've got a smorgasbord of 186 different courses to choose from. And 13 of them are about comparative religion. I'm making that up, but that's educating too. There's education happening in Frosh Week. Okay? But they won't really talk about that if you're in the city of thinkers. But I think here that the solution, the right response to the city of thinkers is to stop thinking. You hear me suggesting that? No. No, I don't think that's the solution. The, the goal isn't just to chuck thinking out and to talk only about, I don't know, love or to talk only about emotions or something like that. Instead, it's, it's to allow love to keep our thinking focused on its truest love. That's God's city. That's God himself. It's God's kingdom. It's one city. City of thinkers. Here's another one, and this one <clears throat> might be more relatable, and perhaps to us, this is where I started off in education. It's education for the city of workers. A city of workers. Sometimes we, um, we talk about tiger parents. At least my wife and I do sometimes. These are parents that seem to be, from the moment their child is born, or perhaps before they're born, you're listening to baby Mozart or something, um, they're, they're always trying to cultivate their children, to angle them, to get into the best school in town, Self-Worth Academy, you know. And they organize every second of their child's day to maximize their potential. Efficiency, hard work, skill, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And when the child asks whether they can play with a friend, you give them 30 minutes of time off next Thursday afternoon. Winning here means going to the best school to get the best education for the best job, to live in the best neighborhood while affording the best car, while saving for the best retirement, and for our children to do better than we did. Might be a little bit alien, I hope so. But this is kind of where I started off. I think I got a little taste of this um, at Penn College in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. The, the professors there, they'd sometimes give our students these pep talks. <clears throat> and uh, the reasoning usually ran kind of like this. You're here to get a degree, to get a better job, to make more money, right? Presumably, to live a better life. 
that's where I started off, and it, that pep talk didn't always work because, <laughs> well, it's Penn College. But there are schools um, I've had the chance to see since then, like Carnegie Mellon down there in uh, Pittsburgh. Fine school, but it's a college of workers. Okay? Getting ahead, doing it better, doing it faster, and more of it. It's the city of success, of ladder climbing, of effectiveness and efficiency. And it's interesting to me that this is, a, this, is a distinctive, this is a distinctive kind of city. It's a distinctive kind of education. It used to be in the past that colleges and universities would form students toward what they called eulogy values. You know, eulogy, it's something that's said about you after you're dead. The kinds of things that people will say about you and say, remember so-and-so and this is what he was like. It used to be that colleges would prepare students for those conversations. That after they're dead, people would reflect on their lives and say, so-and-so is like this and this and this. After you're dead, would it really matter to you if somebody would say, you know, remember how effective he was? Remember how successful he was? Those are fairly hollow things to put on your tombstone. And it used to be that uh, colleges and universities, they'd prepare people for long-term character traits that you'd like somebody to commend about you when you're dead. They're the kind of good and lasting things uh, people will say about themselves who lives and who dies well. Not quite so much at the school of workers. What's being talked about here, the kind of character traits that are cultivated, the kind of outlook, yes, the kind of loves. What's being cultivated here in this city are resume virtues. Okay? Resume virtues. And here's the thing about gaining eulogy virtues. You have to learn them with a community. You have to learn them with a wife and children, if the Lord blesses you that way. You learn virtue when things get in your way and when you embrace that. You learn virtue in weeks when the father taps you on the shoulder and says, you're not in control. Like, okay, I trust you. Those are eulogy virtues. So in the city of workers, you're going to find emphasized here less and less of an emphasis on the eulogy virtues and more and more of an emphasis on what makes you marketable. Okay. What matters most here is what works. More pointedly, what matters here is what pays. And this drive thrive in the College of Workers has penetrated deeply into most colleges and universities. It's driven many of them to the point of crisis. They explore what their consumers, that is students, students and parents, want. And then they provide what their consumers want. Education, kind of. Water parks, yes. Ski slopes, hot tubs, and movie theaters. Let's take the hot tubs and combine them with movie theaters. I'm not kidding. Okay. And you wouldn't be surprised. You wouldn't be surprised that this has put a real bind on a lot of the schools that have really bought deeply into this. Um, as they've continued to try to make themselves more and more marketable by building bigger theaters with hot tubs, the market has diminished. There's been fewer and fewer students. That's a difficult spot to be in. You've got a huge debt load now, and you've got a theater, and there's less people to sit in it. Okay, uh, that's gonna put you in a bind. <clears throat> College tuition becomes in the city of workers payment for a diploma that you buy. And it's a down payment on increased income you'll earn later. 
If you want to follow this a little bit more deeply, um, Jeffrey Bil Bilbro, he's an he's a author and teacher down at uh, Grove City College near us. In a recent article he wrote uh, for Christianity Today, Finding a Real Christian College. It's worth you looking at. Finding a Real Christian College. He points out a problem. He says that theologically conservative colleges are no more likely to invite students into rigorous intellectual and moral formation than are theologically progressive colleges. Okay? It's a big claim. Moral therapeutic deism, well that's a phrase, can be coded left or right politically, but its adherents still imagine God as an enhancement to their pre-existing desires and aspirations. It's a city of workers. And the real tragedy is that insofar as they simply cater to the superficial desires of 18-year-olds, colleges fail to invite young people into the deeper joys and satisfactions of Christian formation, intellectual rigor, and disciplined work. Colleges are not subtle about this, nor universities. You look at the degree pages they outline for you, and here's your steps. Boom, 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 you do this, we'll give you a degree. Here's how much you'll earn. You're in biblical studies, this might not be an issue. <laughs> but if you're in the College of Workers, you'll see this, it's right there. How many graduates from this or the, that degree program at the school land a job at the end of this or that program? What's the message here? Well, the message is, you are not a soul to be formed. You're a consumer to be satisfied. And what do you hear me saying here? That um, jobs, money, are terrible things? I hope that's not all you hear me saying. How about influence? effectiveness. Should we care about those things? I think maybe, to a degree. I'm pretty skeptical about the city of, or the city of workers, okay? But hear this, hear it well. Effectiveness, money, jobs, they are terrible things. They are evil things, okay? I'm not mincing words. They're evil things when they're taken to be absolute goods. When they're taken to be treasures, apart from other treasures. They become evil. And to think about, for myself, orienting an entire school, an entire college around effectiveness and money, that's evil. I'm not in the city of God anymore. A third city. We keep going. <clears throat> this one is the one that's taken over many schools that used to care a lot about formation. I'll call it this. It's the city of expressive individuals. Okay? Expressive individuals. You do you. Find yourself. Just be yourself. Express yourself. Follow your heart. Be authentic. Live your truth. What do these have in common? What's the treasure? Well, I think the treasure here runs like this. There is in each of us, you and especially myself, there is in each of us an original way of being a human being. And to live a full and good and happy life, we have to discover who that person is and paint it on the open canvas of our lives. Okay? There's a long, this isn't the point of the talk, but there's a long history of why we got to this place where the expressive individual is held up on such a pedestal. Suffice it to say here that since the Reformation, these old sources of authority like the church, tradition, kings, queens, scripture, they were all torn down. New sources of authority were raised up 
And when these sources of authorities kind of failed to work out the way they hoped they would and all came crashing down, the only authority many schools, many educations appeal to now is the individual. Okay? These true expressive selves who show up on their campuses every fall to find out who they really are and then to express that. It seems to me that schools and students, if you rewind 200 years plus, one thing they agreed on was that to discover yourself you have to be willing to step outside of yourself. Or in our language, you've got to get over yourself. Right? You have to arrange yourself around truth that's outside of yourself. And the school is there to help you do that. Things have shifted. Now, now it seems that the only truth is what yields the most exciting challenge or the most feeling. I think the poet Walt Whitman captures this well. He says, for many people living as expressive individuals, what they're really looking for, what they're really treasuring is a life rich in experience, open to all kinds of people, luxuriating in the sensual as well as the intellectual, above all, a life of strong feeling, right? What's this school like? What's this city like? Well, I think this will be familiar. Central here is going to be affirmation. Affirmation, you do you, after all. Who am I to tell you what to do with your life? You do you. I affirm that, as well as tools to shape and curate one's lifestyle of choice. The curriculum at a school like this will be like a giant smorgasbord. Just some things sitting out there for you to select from. And delivery of that curriculum is going to be impersonal, frictionless, and above all, easy. Another characteristic here is going to be where the validation of feelings is seen as the primary way to self-esteem. Do our feelings matter? Yes, our feelings matter. Um, I'm not saying they don't matter. But if it becomes the primary way of seeing, being seen as the movement towards self-esteem, toward confidence, there's something of a reversal going on there. And I, th I think also in this school, the school of expressive individuals, students are going to tend to be shielded from adversity. They're going to be, tend to be shielded from adverse situations in a rush to instead affirm their expressions. And academic challenges and personal weaknesses become kind of hard to discuss in a setting like this. Interesting to hear... Uh, a few acquaintances at a local school near us, Allegheny, talk about some of the challenges they have just getting students to turn stuff in sometimes. Because <laughs> whatever you do, you can't threaten. That's not very affirming. It makes it hard for them. <clears throat> I think it makes it hard for the students later. So in the past, education tended to be formative. In the school of expressive individuals in this city, it's soothing. It's therapeutic. What holds this city together? Where is this all going? What's in the treasure chest here? Well, I'd suggest here in this city, there's going to be a lot of discussions about power. Okay. Um, every situation here is going to be analyzed and looked at in terms of who the bad people are who are acting to preserve their power and privilege themselves over the good people. There's going to be a lot of questions in this city about authority, constantly. 
questioning authority. If someone tries to say no, what they're really trying to do is squash your right to individual expression, your true self. You know? And conversation becomes increasingly difficult in this city. It's easier to be silent here in this city or in this school than to be ridiculed or canceled, especially on hot button issues like these days, gender. So I find in the city of expression, it feels to me like this is a city that's in strong reaction. Strong reaction. Okay. They're not really sure where they're going, but they're pretty sure they've left where they once were. So I just asked the question. I line three cities. What cities, what cities have you been prepared for by your education? Think about that a moment. What cities have you been prepared for by your education? I don't need answers now, but I am interested. While you think about that, I'll just throw out this volcano. <clears throat> Students in the class that I teach ethics at Faith Builders, and by the way, I'm talking a little bit, I'm talking about my experience as an educator. I'm not, I want to be sensitive and not self-promotional or something. That's what I'm here to talk about. Um, I give them the option in ethics to, to, to read this book, Sex in the Unreal City by Anthony Essel. And if you've ever heard of him or read of him, he's a conservative Catholic commentator and he, he uses scathing sarcasm and wit and irony to identify what he thinks is the unreal city that's really promoted in today's culture. Sex and the Unreal City is the title of the book. Students have trouble appreciating this book because he's not kind. He's not nice. And he really doesn't care very much about the city of expressive individuals at all. Okay. So I'll just throw this around, Carlin. For what it's worth. Okay. I don't want to leave you with those three cities. Remember, there is another city. Remember first, we are always treasuring something. Always treasuring something. We are always oriented towards some kind of city. Because we're treasuring something, we always have in view one vision or another of what a good city is. The question is not, am I loving a city? The question is, where do my loves lie? Where are my commitments? What city am I loving? If your education takes you through institutional learning, you're probably going to run into all three of these. And it may be, like the city of thinkers, it may be that perhaps that education, if it's really focused on thinking, is going to aim you toward the suburbs of the New Jerusalem. Perhaps for the city of workers. Expressive individuals? Whew. Where's that one at? But these cities, this kind of education, they become outright devilish. And I don't mean that lightly. They become outright devilish when they're seen as free standing, when they're seen as goods in and of themselves, whether worker, expressive individual, or thinker. And because of that, because of that, if any learning, if any learning that we take on ourselves or go through does not build the love of the kingdom, if it doesn't build the love of the new Jerusalem, it is futile. So we might be asking questions like this. As you go through, I want to leave you with this. As you go through your education, ask yourself, how does this class increase my love of the kingdom? I think there's always something there. Even 
No, I shouldn't say it that way. I had an accounting class where I wasn't sure, but I think it was there. You could ask, how does it extend the reach of Christ's name? How does it extend the reach of Christ's authority? How does it increase the love of God and neighbor? How does this class help me love widely and well God's good creation? And many times, many times in your educational journey, if you're going to be heading to institutional education, you're going to be meeting lots of people, okay? And every one of those encounters that you have offers an invitation to extend God's kingdom. Sometimes, especially these days, sometimes where Christ's name has never been named. Other times where it's just been forgotten. So a talk like this can raise for me more questions than it answers. Um, I'd at least offer you this. If you're looking for an education which sees it takes its primary cues as the city of God, the new Jerusalem, here's a few things to be looking for. I think that you'll be entering a worshiping community. You must enter a worship community. Not only about getting your thinking squared up, but also joining heart with heart to love. That's what worship does. You join heart with heart to love of the new Jerusalem and her king. That's what worship does. If you want a Christian education, you'd better be worshiping. Second thing. I think you'd better be looking for a practicing community. Okay? Thinking, yes. Acting, practicing, trying. Look for wisdom and activity. Not only the thinking. In other words, don't let your thinking inappropriately outpace your action. And look for a school that cultivates action too, not just the thinking. Here's one. Look for a community that recognizes that they've been forgiven and who is willing to forgive. Okay. Frequently, frequently we educators do not love the kingdom as wholly as we ought to. We need to learn to be forgiven. We need to learn to forgive. Look for another thing, a submitted community. Okay. Legitimate authority comes through Christ, not through accreditation, not through really tight learning objectives, not through enrollment numbers. Authority comes through Christ. Look also, if you want a submitted community, look also for an authorized and an empowered community. Just remember, Christ in his work, he dragged sinful and death-dealing and dehumanizing powers out into the open. And he exposed them and showed them how weak they were in his resurrection. Christians enter and name and enlarge his victory. They do it in the name of Jesus. And the last one I'd suggest is this. If you're looking for all of these things, worshiping, practice, forgiven, forgiving, uh, uh, authorized and empowered and also submitted, if you're looking for the, this kind of community, you're also going to be looking for this last thing. Look for a countercultural learning community too. Okay. The cult of thinking, the all-encompassing God of production and efficiency, the idolatry 
of the individual and the individual's right to expression. These are the loves of so many schools. These are the treasures. And if a school sets its heart on the kingdom, if it structures itself under the lordship of Jesus Christ, it simply will be countercultural.